Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, cats and dogs, and wonderful, beautiful freaks of nature of all ages. My name is Reverend Brian Bad Hippie Jackson, and welcome to my channel. And what we're looking at there is rope. That is some of the rope. That's the first piece of a handmade cordage, a little test I did using tree bark. Uh, that is another test I did yesterday before I tried to film the tree bark tutorial, the cordage tutorial, and it came out well. And then that piece right there is the piece that I made yesterday for the tutorial, but unfortunately it was already really hot and I had my fans going and it, it, it sounded like I was in a tin can with a freaking jet plane. So yeah, I had to 86 that recording and we're going to do it again. Now we're going to do part of it this morning and we're going to do part of it this afternoon because what we have is tree bark and quite a goodly little amount of it in long strands pretty 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 freaking long strands um, but I peeled this tree bark down a couple of weeks ago and it is very very dry and it's hard to work with when it's dry so what we're going to do is we're going to hopefully not break anything <sighs> We're going to fold it up, there we go, we're going to put it in some water, hard to do this with one hand and still record, we're going to stick it in some water for a couple of hours and let it rehydrate a little bit so that when we get into making our cordage it's going to be a little bit more pliable and easy to work with. And while I'm waiting for that to happen, uh, in the army, we called this shit liper juice because it sustains life. So, anyways, I'm going to go ahead and shut this down for now. And when we come back a little bit later, after that's rehydrated a bit, I'm going to show you how to make cordage. All right, and there we go. So they are, uh, they're saturated now, much better, more pliable, easier to, but they're too wet um, because, of course, we soaked them. So I laid them out to air dry for a little bit, and once they've dried off enough, uh, to to be workable, we're we're gonna we're gonna make some cordage. We should be able to make a couple of at least one nice long hunk, one nice long piece of rope, and there's enough there that I can probably not only show you how to twist the cordage, but I can also show you how to splice it. So if you have shorter pieces and you need a longer piece of cordage, but you have shorter pieces of bark or grass or whatever you're working with, um, you'll know how to splice them together to get that longer piece of cord that you need. So we're gonna let these sit here and air dry for a while. Not sure how long it's gonna take, but you know, I'm the only one that's gonna have to wait on it because you're just gonna wait for the video cut after I turn this off, so you're not gonna have to wait. Anyways, when they're dried enough to work with, I will come back and we will make cordage. The bark seems to be dry enough that I can work with it but I still need to do things like cut these down into a more acceptable size that's much too wide to work with I need everything to be closer to this width or a little bit thinner so I've already got a few that are separated and at length but some of them might be a bit too wide so we're gonna cut those down um, trim them down into a more manageable width that's going to give us what we need for our cordage. Uh, but before we do that, yes, I have a cutting board here because I'm going to use it when I start cutting these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the knife to make sure I've got straighter, more even cuts and I don't want to dig into my table. But before we do that, we're going to go over a little bit of a quick tutorial on how to sharpen knives. Uh, these are whetstones, of course, and they're both double-sided. Um, this one has the roughest texture. It's just the coarsest. So this side is 
the most coarse. This side is a little less coarse for a finer blade. And then this other stone, this is even less coarse and this is the fine stone for honing the edge and then if I really want to get into it I can finish it up with my kitchen honing bar which I also use on my kitchen knives but so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take my handy dandy knife here which I use a lot and we're going to put a little bit of an edge on it. Now, I did forget to get one thing, so let me go grab that. And since wet stones actually need to be wet, we're going to get some lubricant. And we're going to just drench it. Now, this is a newer stone. I've only had it for a few weeks, so I don't really know if you can see it, but this lubricant is just soaking straight into the stone when I spray it because it's still fairly new and it's still fairly porous. This one, however, it doesn't soak in as well because that's an older stone and I've used it a lot more. All right, so just that to keep things off of my cutting board. I don't want my cutting board contaminated with lubricant if I can help it. Of course, you know, I'll wash it later. All right, so for sharpening a knife, um, if you watched my video on survival and camping handbooks, you will know that I highly recommend the Boy Scout handbook. And one of the things I said was the Boy Scout handbook has all the instructions you need for knowing how to sharpen your knives. And so that's the method we're going to use. So to sharpen a knife using the Boy Scout handbook method, or actually it's the same method my granddaddy taught me, so the Boy Scouts probably got it from him. Uh -huh. uh, this one is serrated, so we don't want to sharpen the serrates, we just want to sharpen the edge. The serrates are something completely different. So we're just gonna go from there to the tip and just get the edge and leave the serrates alone. So they just come towards you at about a 20 to 25 degree angle on the knife. Um, I had a professional chef once tell me when I worked in one of them really fancy restaurants, and yes, I do know how to do chef type, type of stuff, um, that the proper angle for sharpening a knife is a, supposedly 23 degrees. Now, I don't know if that's for all knives or if he's just talking about kitchen knives, but I've generally found that, you know, somewhere around a 25 degree tilt, 30 degree tilt is probably good for sharpening your knives. Now, we are not going to be doing the shaving hair off my arm bullshit. Never saw the sense in that crap. Okay? Um, I just want it sharp. I don't care if I can shave with it. I mean, a razor hasn't touched my face in, in, a, in over a year. All right, the only thing I do is I get my electric trimmer and I clean my beard up, but I don't actually shave. So there is absolutely no reason for me to have a knife that is so sharp I can shave with it. I just need it sharp enough to be able to do the things I want to do. So we're going to come towards this like we're cutting because that's what you want to do. You want to come, now if you want to go with this side left-handed, <laughs> if you're left-handed, you can go away from you as well, just that I'm not left-handed. But we'll do it like that for the other side, kind of like you're whittling. Like you're cutting into the stone. There you go. See, and then you get that, that side done. Clean it off. Ooh, feels much better already. Now we're going to go to the next side, which is less coarse than this side. This gets the primary sharpening started, and then as you go down, uh, the coarseness of your stones, you're honing your edge up even better. So we're just going to do that on all four of these sides.
And this shouldn't take too long at all because I take care of my knives. And, you know, I only use my knife, this knife, this knife only gets used three or four times before it gets sharpened. That's the way I am with all my blades. All my blades are, are well maintained, they're kept clean, they're kept sharp. There is absolutely no sense in having a knife, or any kind of blade for that matter, if you're not going to tend to it, if you're not going to take care of it, and if you're not going to keep it sharp. I think I went over in an earlier video my opinion on that, um, what my, when I was showing you some of my weapons. Um, because quite honestly, a dull blade will hurt you worse than a sharp blade will. Um, because a sharp blade, if you cut yourself, you're going to get cut. Uh, depending on what the blade is, and you know, it could be deep, you're probably going to need some stitches. But it's better to get cut with a sharp blade than it is to be cut with a dull blade. Because a sharp blade is going to give you a nice clean cut. And it's going to be very easy to stitch up. A dull blade, you're going to be running the risk of tearing the skin. It's not going to be a clean cut. It's going to be more like a rip. You know, instead of cutting paper, you know, uh, the difference between cutting fabric and ripping fabric, between cutting paper and ripping paper, it's the same thing with your skin. The difference between getting a cut and getting a rip. A dull blade will tear and rip the skin, and it makes sewing it up and fixing it a hell of a lot more difficult, and it's also more likely to get infected. So keep your blades sharp. If you're not going to keep your blades sharp, then give them to me because you don't deserve to have them. Now, I will take care of them. Keep your blades sharp. No sense in having one if it ain't sharp. Keep your fingertips away from those edges because if you come down and slip, if I slip off of here, it's going to go straight off the knife and it's going to go over my knuckles. I can, and I'm not going to cut myself. If you're holding it like this and you slip, you're going to cut yourself, okay? So safety first, safety first. Always keep your fingers out of the way of the blade. If it slips for some reason, you're much less likely to sustain injury. Now the reason this is a half a block of whetstone instead of a full one is because I got that one before I got this new one and my son has knives and he didn't have a whetstone so we took a hammer and busted this bitch in half so he's got half of it and I've got half of it. Yeah, much nicer. I had somebody tell me once, like, why you want to do it like that? Most can openers have a knife sharpener on the back. Yeah, they do. But I can get a better edge on it with this than I can with a fucking knife sharpener on a can opener. I guarantee it. And there's also the fact of what happens when the electric goes out. How the hell are you going to sharpen your knives with an electric appliance and no electricity? Okay? That's why I do as much by hand as I can because I am not dependent on electricity. If the lights go out, everybody else is all freaking out. Uh -huh, what do we do? I start a fire, you know? I know exactly what to do. Half the shit I do anyways doesn't depend on electricity. It's called self-sufficient. It also leaves less of a footprint and it's more envir environmentally sound. Okay, so there we go. Let's get this out of the way. Clean that off. Oh, that feels pretty good. Get it with the honing bar real quick.
Very nice. Okay. So. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna take this and we're gonna see where these splits are here, where this big hunk is like split into three and four. We're gonna start there and we're gonna run straight up this hunk of bark. Just flatten that fucker out, there we go. Just like that. Now this one right here might be too wide. If it is, it's okay, because we can always trim it down. We also don't have to use the entire length if we don't want to. This one is probably going to have to be trimmed again anyways. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and get this section here. Try to keep it as much straight down the middle as I can. I want my pieces to be fairly uniform. They're going to bind on themselves better if they've got a better uniformity to them. Okay, that looks good. That looks good. We're going to have to thin it from here up, though. So we're going to pull from right about here. I think we'll make our initial cut there. Kind of go up the middle of this one and there's a gap there just cut into that gap got it pull that out and then just kind of try to stay close to the middle we don't want them to be too damn skinny um, mainly because this is older bark. It's been peeled off the tree for about a week. Fucking lay straight, you piece of dick. Um, and we had to resaturate it, of course. And with it being dried and resaturated, I don't want it to be too thin because I don't think it's going to hold as well if it's too thin. And we're going to take that to right there and call that a good cut. This one's going to have to come down. Okay, and this top part here is degraded. We don't want it. And we're going to cut down to here so that we can get a longer strip coming off of this. And this short piece up top will probably either just be discarded or used for splicing if we have to splice. So we'll set that aside. And then this one's going to be our problem child. We don't need to cut this tip. We're gonna set this piece here aside just like we did that other one, just in case we need it for a splice or something. And then we're gonna go straight down the middle of this one and cut it in half as well.
take your time on this. If you have to go really slow, then go really slow. It's, it's better to do it a little slower and get it right than to rush it and fuck it up and have to start all over again. It's one thing I always hated about working for other people, employers. Go faster, go faster, go faster. Suck my cock, you bastard. I want to do it right. I don't give a fuck about fast. I care about right. They always want you to do it faster. But then what ends up happening is you get people doing it faster that do it wrong. And then I got to come in behind them and fucking fix it. And they don't want to pay overtime for that shit. It's just more effective to do it right the first time. All right, so we've got our cordage cut. Um, I'm gonna set this stuff aside. I'll sheath up that knife. Okay, so to start making cordage, we're gonna find, let's get a few strips of about the same length. These are close. That'll work, so there's two. Okay, so we're gonna use two longs and two shorts. All right, so a short and a long there, and a short and a long there. Now the reason I'm using two shorts and two longs is because we're gonna, if I've got four more. So we're gonna set those aside, we'll be using them later. All right, so to twist cordage, first thing I wanna do is get rid of this ratty shit at the top here. So, first step in the parade is you take two pieces, just like this. Now, generally, you, when you get to better at it, you're going to start with all four pieces and just work them around in your hands so that you're, you know, doing it all at the same time. But I'm going to simplify things. We're just going to start with two. And what you want to do is I always start by twisting them clockwise away from me. Now, the initial twist, whether it's clockwise away from you or counterclockwise towards you, is, is up to you. But remember which direction you start with because when you start taking these doubles, you know, you're going to take two pieces and twist it on each other. And then when you start taking these and twisting them the doubles together to make a thicker rope, you're going to go in the opposite direction, and that helps bind the cordage together. Um, I'll explain that when we get there. But you want to twist them together on each other, and you want them to be about, uh, about to the point where they're starting to kink up on themselves. That's how tight you want them. Now, when you get little things like this going on, just try to work it in. It'll hold if you can work it in right. So we're going to twist this cordage together, or these pieces of bark. And we're just going to keep doing that all the way down this line. There we go. That did not set in proper. There. That's where we want that. where that little flubby was right there and it's worked in fairly decent and it's looking good Once again just keep going down twisting it on itself as tight as you can without breaking it 
you want it to the point that it starts to kink up on itself a little bit and then you know you're tight enough. Set that one there. And we're going to start this one. And we're going to work it in the same direction that we did the first one. Start right there. And I'm going to go clockwise away from me. This one actually is a little too fat in spots. I probably should have trimmed it down more, but it'll still work. And quite honestly, when you're out in the bush, if you don't have a knife, you're just gonna have to hand rip it anyways and deal with whatever width you get. Um, but it's a good thing to know because if you are out in the wild, if you're stranded, if you're in a, in a bad spot, you need, uh, and you need cordage for anything, to lash a tripod together for cooking, to lash, uh, to lash things together for a shelter, uh, to, to, to make a, a belt to hold your freaking pants up, to replace a shoestring, whatever you need, you can, you can just get bark or, or long grass, like uh, uh, sawgrass and monkey grass works really, really good. So monkey grass is awesome for this. Uh, monkey grass is basically sawgrass, it's just what we call it down south long long good sturdy grass and it makes excellent excellent cordage monkey grass or sawgrass is great for that stuff bamboo strips if you're in a location where you can get your hands on bamboo just cut the bamboo down into strips and you can make cordage out of bamboo strips uh, any of those big huge leaves like uh, the big ferns the elephant ears and stuff like that any big fern or leaf that's got fronds on it that can be torn into long strips, you can use that as well. There are tons, <coughs> tons and tons of natural materials that can be used to make cordage. And I just broke a piece. So what we're gonna have to do here, because that snapped in a thin spot, We're gonna take it back up a little further and we're gonna rewrap. We are not gonna 86 this piece. We're gonna keep it. We can still make it work. There we go. Okay, and then what you're gonna do is you're going to take these two pieces and as I told you said earlier now you're wanting to go the other direction so since this first twist was away from me clockwise the second twist is going to come towards me counter clockwise All right now the reason we do this like this is because you've got natural fibrous material which has good texture anyways and it is wound on itself in one direction which of course is going to want to try to unwind so when you get two different or more sets of that material you wind it on itself in the other direction, well that's going to try to want to want to try to unwind too. So what you're looking at doing is with the inner ones trying to unwind in one direction and the outer ones trying to unwind in the other direction, the opposing force actually holds the whole shooting match together. Just like that just like that that's how it works and then we're just going to go straight down this line 
and we're going to get close to the end and once I get them close to the end there we're going to take those other pieces and I'm going to show you how to do a splice. Let me go ahead and set my time lapse up so I can do that. Okay, now that I've got it twisted up on itself to this level, what you're going to see is where we're going to splice, we have two short pieces and two long pieces. And whenever you're going to have to splice, you want it set up similar to that. There doesn't have to be that big of a difference between the short and long, but you do need a short and a long. When we splice these together, what we're going to do is we're going to use the same process as we used before but we're going to take our longer piece and set it on that short and then we're going to take our shorter piece and set it right there okay like this get all those pieces together we're going to start with this longer piece first and we are going to wrap just like we did before. With that longer piece connected to the short. And then we're going to take our shorter piece, feed it in now, and wrap all of these together. And so what you're going to end up having is you're going to have a little bit of a fat spot in there where you got the splice going but by having differing lengths where that splice is you're you've got more than one point of contact it's not all spliced in the exact same spot it's spliced in a bit of a length which gives it more strength and helps it hold together a bit better and then going partially down this, you're going to get, of course, a three wrap until you get towards the end, and then it's going to turn back into a two. All right, we'll get that a little bit of a distance there, and then we're going to do same thing with this one we're gonna feed that long one right there and we're gonna feed the short one right here so let's go ahead and wrap this long in real quick and then feed the shorter one in before you get to the end of the first short one. Now you don't have to have that big of a variation between the long and the short. I just over exaggerated it so it would be easier to show you how that splice actually works. All right. And now that we have our splices set in, we can go ahead and start coming back on it again and get those splices twisted in.
just like this. All right, and once again, I'm gonna go set up the time lapse. Oh, I dropped a piece. I'm gonna set up the time lapse and we'll finish this off. Son of a bitch. Okay. <laughs> Today's not my day for certain things. It is my day for some things, but not my day for other things. Ugh. I was finishing off the recording for the cordage and my camcorder, the battery died. So I have to finish it off using the webcam and I just broke my glasses. And that really sucks. I kind of need these. Anyway, since I'm already recording and I'm already here and I'm not going to make my glasses any better by complaining about them, let's finish off the cordage video. There it is. There's the piece of cordage that we just made. Ooh, I got to lean back to get the whole thing in. Got to go fucking diagonal and shit. Uh, there it is anyways that's a that's a nice size piece of cordage that's probably a foot and a half to two feet worth of rope there wank 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 with a splice in the middle so this is actually eight pieces of bark there's four running from the top to the splice and then there's a separate four running from the splice to the end so we took and we spliced them together and yeah, boing, 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 boing. Woo, hoo, hoo, hoo. Woo, yeah. This shit is cool. Will it support weight? Uh, actually, yes, it will. So let's see what kind of weight it'll support. I'm pretty sure. That my knife is not going to be a problem. What else will it support? <sighs> ah, um, let's find something a little heavier than that knife. Okay, this will be a test. Let's see if we can pick up this splitting mall with the cord I just made. All right, so we're gonna take this cord and we're going to, uh, I'm not going to tie a knot in the end. I'm just going to do this and I'm going to set it on the ground so that it's supporting it. And then I'm going to lift and I'm going to hope for the best. And I'm going to hope for the best. And look at that. Look at that. That is a fucking I think that's a six, that's an eight pound. I think that's an eight pound splitting mall. Eight pound splitting mall with oak handle and I'm holding it off the ground using tree bark rope. Yeah, this shit works. All right, awesome. That is just fucking amazing. That is fucking amazing. So if you were, if you doubted the strength of this rope, it just picked up and I don't even know what the weight is. It's at least an eight pound maul. It might be a 10 pounder, but it's at least an eight pound splitting maul and with the handle and this piece of tree bark rope made from four strands of damn bark and spliced together with four more strands of bark, just two sets of twists, one going one way, one going the other way. And that's probably a full 10 pounds if not more so yes you can easily use this to lash something together you can hang a cook pot off of it over a fire this is that is how you make cordage out of tree bark cordage that is stout enough to work now don't go for nothing way too heavy because it will break if you get it too heavy but we know that it will hold a fucking splitting maul or a sledgehammer or something of that weight those things are not light and there we go 
There we go. Let's look at it from end to end. Ooh, doggy. Ooh, look at that. Ain't that purdy? Ain't that purdy? That is the ugliest purdy you'll ever see. Ha <laughs> ha, or the purdiest ugly. Because, yeah, it's an ugly piece of rope, but it's also a beautiful piece of rope. And it is functional. Functional. There we go. That's it. All right. That is how to make cordage out of tree bark. Please do not forget to check the links in the description below for the Disabled American Veterans and the Wounded Warriors Project. Let's please help support our veterans. If you like the video, then hit the like button, subscribe and share. Tell your friends and family to hit the like button, subscribe and share. Please do not forget to leave me a comment. They are always welcome, good, bad, or somewhere in between. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for coming and hanging out with me for a while. I greatly appreciate and love every single one of you. You guys rock. Thank you so much. And until next time, this is Reverend Brian Bad Hippie Jackson saying peace, love, clean underwear, happy gaming, happy homesteading, and may the essence bless your choices.